now we can start. So I'm here here today with Artu. So he's a specialist uh, in heat network modeling, and he agreed to come here and show me a bit of the demo model. Just walk walk through. If you if you are watching this video, uh, very likely you have gone through the installation steps, and you now uh, have can launch your software and can open the demo model there. The next step will be then to start exploring the demo model uh, because it's uh, one of the models that we refer to very often in our documentation. And it's also the model that is used for, for tutorials. So it's a good idea to understand what's in there and have a quick overview of it. And Artu will help, help us with that. So please Artu. Yeah. Sure. So here we have the basic user interface of Fluidit Heat. And the first thing you can notice is this uh, big map view window where we have our demo model. And uh, uh, we can just uh, like move the map with the uh, scrolling button with our mouse. And yeah, basically just zoom in and out like with uh, like in any any other softwares. And um, here we can see that we have some components and then the background map. And of course we can change the background layer so you can bring your own drawings or download some other, like for example, satellite images. But uh, this time I'm just using the open straight map so you can see the name over here. And then on top of that, I have just a like white color layer. So it's a bit easier to see all the components like pipes and plants and consumers. And uh, yeah, so you can notice that whenever I click a component on, uh, on the map, this properties window on the right hand side is updated. So for example, when I click the main plant over here, we can see all the parameters uh, which you can adjust uh, for this plant. And same way from here, you can, for example, see the results. This is just one way to see the results. We have uh, a lot of different ways to investigate those, but this is just a basic simple list of all the results which are uh, for this main plant component. If I click... Well, I, uh, sorry, sure. just... Uh just to interrupt, uh, I think there's an important point that this tab of results uh, is also very useful if you want to know which result is available for which component, because each component has, they have a different list of results available. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. And in district energy systems where we have the supply and return network, uh, you can also see very easily that do we even have like a uh, result for supply or return network. So I can, for example, zoom in and here we have like two separate pipes. So basically the normal pipe component over here, it has the supply and the return line, as you can see. But here we have like two different pipes. So this one has only the supply line and this one has only the return line. And as you mentioned that we can always check that what kind of results are available for this component. So when we open this tab, we can see that, okay, we have all the return, uh, return results, but when we check the supply results, all of those are just empty. So that is also one way to check that do we even have like the uh, return or either supply side of the network included in the component. Um, but yeah, in general, all the different component types. So for example, consumers have different results compared to, for example, uh, plant components. And, and uh, for example, pipes have different uh, results compared to junctions uh, and so on. So uh, this tab is very, very useful, useful for that. Um, yeah, first we could actually just investigate this uh, network, which we have opened over here. 
So now I have visualized more or less all the components I have in this model. It's possible to hide, for example, all the consumers, which are these small pur purple dots over here. So if I want, I can just hide those and then I would have, for example, only the pipes and plants. But in these visualizations, I have all the components shown on the map. And uh, first we could just check those basic parameters of the components and then move on to other other things, for example, how we can check results and that kind of things. Artu, sorry uh, to interrupt, just uh, just to clarif clarify here also also for me. So the black dots around the map, they are they are junctions. So they are these nodes that connect one pipe element to another one. Uh, what are what is the function of of that element that junction? So yeah, exactly. Uh, in general, we have like two different categories for components. We have a point component and then we have links. Basically, plants, uh, these junctions and all the dots which you can uh, see on the map are like point components. And then there needs to be a link component like a pipe or heat exchanger or a valve which connects to uh, junctions or to plants together. So uh, when we investigate the network, we can see that every time we have a point component, after that we need to have a link and then we have another point component. And um, for example, here, instead of just a pipe, we have a pump component which links two junctions together. So because this is like a hydraulic model, you always need to make sure that all the components are linked together. So for example, here, when I, cli uh, I click the junction, uh, sorry, when I click the pipe, we can see that the start node is this junction uh, uh, 33 and 35 is the end node. And when I zoom in and check that, okay, here we have the junction, so this is the, uh, it was the starting junction, right? Yeah. And this is then the uh, end junction uh, 35. So yeah, all the, all the components need to be linked together, even the consumers. So there you can see that we have the light gray line between the junction and the consumer. So it's very important that all the components are linked together. And if, if you accidentally forget to link those components together and you try to simulate the model, we have this called validator, which uh, warns you that, okay, your components are not together, you cannot simulate the model. So please uh, go and check that, uh, that those components are together. Yeah. Thank, thank you. So yeah, next we could investigate those components a little. So all the components have quite a lot of parameters and that's because we have so many different ways to model. There are different levels how we want to model. Sometimes we just need to have like big model and high level understanding how things work. So then we don't need to go into details that much. So then we can give some, uh, we can give just some basic parameters. But so in other cases, we have just a small model where we just need to investigate uh, some very specific phenomena in our uh, network. So that's why we need to give like multiple different parameters to adjust that the uh, model is as accurate as possible. So you don't need to always give all the parameters. There are some basic parameters which you need to give more or less every time. But as you can see, the list is very long, but I have used only a few of those. So for example, when we check the main plant, uh, we can see that uh, I have given the static head control, which means that we fix the pressure level uh, at certain point. And here I have said that I fix the return pressure. You can also fix the supply pressure or the middle pressure between those. 
to some specific pressure level, and here I'm using three bars. We can uh, see the results after a couple of minutes that actually the pressure is three bars at this uh, main plant. Then when we are talking about district energy systems, we have always the supply and the return side of the network. So we have kind of like two networks on top of each other. We need to uh, make sure that the pressure difference between the networks is uh, always above some level. So let's say at least one bar or something. So that's why we are, uh, we are also main main maintaining the pressure difference in the network. So this plant also has a pressure difference setting 1.5 bars and some control nodes where we are keeping this 1.5 bars. So you can just select some points from the map where you want to keep that pressure difference. And for example, if I want to check those uh, control nodes, you can just open the list from here and you can see that, okay, these are the junctions or you can just right click on top of the main plant, plant and select and select control nodes. So now you can see all the yellow dots on the map and these are the control nodes where we are main, maintaining 1.5 bar pressure difference. And since we have now multiple points, it makes sure, uh, it makes sure that the minimum pressure difference it is 1.5. So because we have six of those, there can be higher pressure difference, but the minimum pressure difference in the one specific junction is 1.5. Um, yeah, so the pressure difference type of control for a plant is one type. Then the most basic one is just a constant power. So we can just define that this power plant uh, produce some specific amount of power, for example, 1000 kilowatts. And then it just keep pumping that much that it can uh, push the water to the system and keep uh, producing 1000 kilowatts. But the pressure difference setting is a bit more smart because it makes sure that the pressure difference is 1.5. And when the consumers start to consume power, the pressure difference start to decrease. And when it hits the 1.5 limit, the plant component sees that, okay, now we don't have enough pressure difference because the consumers are consuming water and then it starts to produce more water to the system. So it's kind of like a, a better way to control the uh, production of the plants because it's a smart way. It doesn't overproduce power because it knows what is the consumption and so on. Then, uh, of course, we can define the supply temperature. So you can give time series, you can give it constant values, uh, you can give these uh, called curves, which are as a function of ambient temperature. So I can give you a, like a preview of this. So now you can see that we have the X axis where we have the air temperature which goes from minus 30 degrees to 30. When we are in Finland, we have like very cold winters where we can have like minus 30 degrees. And then we are pushing uh, around 115 degree water to the system. But during like hot summer days, we are just using it's something like 75 degree water. And um, yeah, you always need to give like the static head control for main plant because we need to define what is the pressure level where we are uh, running our system. Then you need to give some power uh, production type. So it can be constant power or pressure difference. And after that, of course, if the setting is constant power, we need to define the power value. If we are using uh, pressure difference, we need to define the pressure difference setting, so how many bars we want to maintain, and then the control nodes, there can be only one or there can, there can be multiple of those. And the one last thing is that we need to give some supply temperature. So it can be like constant value in this case, for example, 90 degree or power curve. And when we have, for example, in this case, two different parameters for supply temperature, uh, there, the curve 
always overrides the constant values in fluidity heat. So in quite many components, we have always the time series pattern and curve. So the curve always overrides the constant value and the time series always overrides the curve values. Thanks, Arthur. Just a, a, a question here. Uh, since there are many parameters, um, probably the users that just just started, they might feel that this is might feel overwhelming. So just uh, if if they forget to set, let's say the contract control type would be a power, and and you forget to give a value for the power, and you try to simulate what happens then if you forgot something. So you can quite uh, immediately see that something is wrong if you don't give any power because then we are not producing any power at all. And if the model is otherwise uh, working, that we have some consumption there, uh, it just immediately says that, okay, that the, uh, the network or the simulation isn't working and you will get some error uh, which indicates that there is something wrong. And um, if you are using, for example, in this case, pressure difference, you don't need to give any power setting. But of course, uh, if we use this constant power and we don't define anything, then the validate, validator will say that, hey, you will have some problems there that you haven't defined any power. Okay, so that's good. So then you will either see clearly something is wrong you will get a validator a warning or error indicating that you yeah. forgot to add something. So that's okay. That's easier then. So you can try, try many times and see what you will, you will find out what's uh, missing. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And uh, one, one other thing is that there are many of the parameters and sometimes the name of it is not fully descriptive. So can you show where to find the description of the parameters? Yeah, so every time I click a parameter name, for example, the static head control over here, so you will get some short description uh, down here. And of course, we have also Fluidit Wiki support page where you downloaded the software. So there you can see some more comprehensive description. But here you can, for example, see some uh, units for, for example, for the power, you can see that uh, base power setting in kilowatts, and this is updated based on the units you are using in your model. And then it says a couple of things uh, that the, if it's uh, like, for example, it's if you haven't defined any number, or you're using power uh, pressure difference setting, it's not limited, and and so on. So it will give some uh, information about the about the parameter and as you mentioned that some of these names uh, are not complete so you can see here that also what is the uh, description and it helps you to uh, understand that what is the exact parameter okay thanks thanks Artu. i think the main point is that important component that we could talk about it at least 10 minutes 20 minutes more but maybe we try to keep it short i yeah. see here on the map uh, that you have other components that look very similar to the main power plant but a little bit different so the the red buildings there they look like yeah. factories so can you talk a bit about those yeah so in fluidity heat we have two different plant components we have the main plant which is this one right here and the normal plant component. This is just a plant, so you can see the type over here. And when we click the main plant, you can see that the type is main plant. And the main difference between these two plant components is the static head control. So basically when we have the expansion tank in our network, it's located in the main plant. And here you can uh, define the static head control. But for this basic plant component, we don't have this kind of settings at all. We just have the pressure difference controls, uh, which we can use for adjusting the pressure levels. So the, 
the pressure difference, but we cannot define that what is the static head uh, in our network. Okay. So in real life, it's the it's the expansion tank which is located in the plants. All right. Thanks. And I see that there's a description there. This is a geothermal plant. Yeah. Uh, in the demo model. And all right, can you show us? Yes. So there's uh, where you can find description of components. And I, I believe that when you read through this, this makes uh, the understanding of the demo model much easier because you understand what what this component is trying to do in the demo model. What exactly. So here we have more comprehensive description how in this specific model the plant is working. So this isn't default description of the components. This is for this demo model which I have written. So it describes uh, that what settings we have over here and why those settings are like they are. So we have quite complicated settings even in this demo model we have more simple ones and more complicated ones and especially those more complicated ones i've been trying to explain as well as possible because it's very important that all the modelers can understand what kind of things they are, can actually do with fluided heat okay thanks thanks Arto. and just uh, to keep us still on the map what what we are seeing here um we've gone through the uh, pipes then junctions then the plants and now uh, I see that there are some blue uh, components there so there are some symbols can you talk yes. a bit about those so the all the blue symbols over here indicates that we have a pumping station there and when we zoom in we can see that some of these just have one pump and some of these have for example a valve and pump in the same uh in the same uh station and actually this uh blue symbol is just a symbol it doesn't uh affect on the simulation or anything anything so you can just change the symbol from the parameters so it's like a junction but i have just given this uh pumping station symbol for this same way i could for example give this symbol for this junction so now i just have the list of uh, different symbols over here and then I can just for example say that okay this is tank and the symbol is updated based on that but for most of the junctions I don't use any symbols because I just want to highlight some very specific parts in our network that those are important and pumping stations are of course uh, one of those very important uh, places which I want to highlight in the network. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, just a comment about this that you can users can import their own symbols so you can use uh, the standard symbols of, of your country, your location, if if you if you wish to do that. Uh, I, I see also on the map here this uh, street or avenue called Helsing in Katu. So, so this just going few steps back, this demo model is placed somewhere in Helsinki, the capital of Finland, right? Yeah, exactly. And everywhere we are on the map, and if you want to open, for example, Google Maps or Bing Maps or any other, uh, you can just always click on top of the map and open, for example, to the Google Street View uh, on your browser. And I can just drag and drop the window over here. So here we can actually see that where we are on the map. So now I just have opened this on my browser and it's the same place over here. So it makes it very easy to actually investigate that where we are. And of course you can like use the background map as it is, but you can have also option to investigate that what kind of buildings we have around this area and so on. So sometimes it's very important that we can use, for example, the Google, Google uh, Street View or uh, Bing Bird View uh, kind of uh, tools. Okay, thanks. Yes, yeah, so that's definitely very simple feature, but very, very handy 
to explore. And this is a demonstration of model that is placed somewhere in the city of Helsinki that I yes. believe has a interesting, um, uh, let's say, topography. So you can have then pumps. This demo model has pumps and so on. So there's interesting topography, and that's why this demonstration of model was was then placed placed there, uh, uh, if I remember correctly. But uh, I see this this uh, this part of the model that you have zoomed in is really interesting because there's also another component that I see um, this little red dot there. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about? So. Uh, as in like real district uh, net district heating networks and cooling ne networks as well, we can always close our pipes. So this is just a, like a valve which we can close and open. You can define that do you want to close like both sides. So you can select that, okay, is it just a supply or return or both of them? And when we close, the pipe, you can see that the component is red, but when I take this uh, flag off, you can see that now it's black and it indicates that now the uh, pipe is open. Uh, I, when I have like these closed valves, uh, I want to highlight that I have some pipes closed. There are some other ways to close pipes as well, but um, it's very important that when we have some closed pipes, it's important to highlight those. So that's why I'm using these gate valves. And one thing about valves in fluid heat is that we have actually two different valve uh, components. So we have the uh, like the gate valve, and then we, we then we have the like the control valve. And this one can be either fully open or fully closed. But the second one, which is over here, uh, is like a control valve, which you can adjust the diameter of the, of the valve. So basically you can just give different settings for this, just maintain specific flow or maintain specific head loss or that kind of things. Okay, thanks. So there's a pipe with an X crossed on it is it does it mean that the pipe is then closed yeah so you can see that once we have this uh, gate valve closed it also adds this little cross over here so there are actually two ways i can close the pipe the first one is that uh, i could just from the uh, pipe settings i could just give that the uh, status is closed, so then uh, there won't be any flow through this pipe. And when I add this, you can see the same little cross over here. Uh, this is like one way to do it. But as we can see that when we zoom out, it's very much easier to see these like gate valves because it's like they are in the real world that they have some gate valves. So that's why it's kind of good habit to use the gate valves when we are closing pipes. But the second way is like we have over here that we have the gate valve. And if we check the pipe parameters, you can see that it just open, but then we have added this gate valve, which is closed. So it automatically adds this extra notification that it has this cross over there. So Basically, just two different ways to close the pipe. OK, thanks. Uh, maybe you zoom out a little bit. I saw some thing that caught my eye. Uh, the consumers, I see that some of them are kind of pink color, but there are a few of them that have this uh, larger red dot. Ah, over here. Yeah, for example, that. One. So, yeah. This is like uh, any other consumer, but I have just set the parameter important. So, so as you can see, if we have, for example, very big uh, consumer, we can set that it's important. And when I click this e important parameter, you can see that it just highlights the uh, highlights the consumer component. So, same way I could just, for example, say that. 
this consumer is important as well. And then it uh, will be the same kind of thread, a bit bigger dot on the map. OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think there's maybe just one thing on the map still left, uh, or maybe one or two, let's see. Um, close to your mouse, there's this sort of um, uh, dot which is in the, in this park yes that one yeah so here we have this called a user weather station and um, uh, as we know that we use weather data quite a lot to forecast how much do we need to uh, produce heat and how much the consumers are consuming heat power so that's why we have this built in way to fetch weather data from weather providers. And of course, those have some specific specific locations. For example, here we have the University of Helsinki and they have actually these measurement equipments here at the campus. And this is the specific location of that. But of course, uh, our network isn't always super close to this kind of weather stations. In this case, we are just lucky to have one just next to our network. But uh, to get more accurate weather uh, measurements, we can combine, combine multiple different weather, me, uh, weather measurements into one. So basically, when we add this user weather stations over here, we just uh, combine the measurements. So basically it's an average of these two, two uh, components or two weather stations which have just downloaded, let's say, air temperature. So, uh, and then I can set that, okay, this model use the average. In this case, these are quite uh next to each other so the distance between for example from the user weather station to this one is more or less the same as here so that's why it's close to the average but if we move this closer to this one uh the weight for this measurement is much bigger compared to this because the distance is longer from this measurement point to the user weather station so, but it's a bit more advanced. Quite often we can use if the model isn't like super big and we have quite many measurement points, then we can just use this dry directly without this user weather station. But it's up to up to modeler how they want to how they want to define the weather weather parameters and the time series which are used in the simulation. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, that's uh, definitely interesting. If you have city-wide, very large model, and you happen to have measurements uh, quite far or many measurements, but they are not exactly the location where you are doing your study, then you can add this component, of course, and then do the interpolation yeah. to define uh, data. That that. What would be the temperature in that specific location? based on the data that you have a bit further. That, that's uh, yeah, So actually in this specific scenario, I'm not using time series at all. So if we check the scenario, which is activated, it's this weather minus 26. And here I'm just using constant air temperature minus 26 all the time. Even though I'm simulating multiple times, the air temperature uh, uh, is the same all the time. But uh, if I use, for example, here we have a different scenario, uh, even a year simulation. So then uh, for each time step where we have a measurement, let's say that we have measurement for every hour. So it will uh, produce a time series where we have the uh, average air temperature for every hour. So it's not just a single value, it's the, entire time series for the for the simulated time okay yes that's very interesting i think we can go soon to the scenarios a little bit more but before we jump there um there's one thing left on the map that again caught, caught my eye so near the university of helsinki you have another component there 
yes, that that one. Yeah. So here we have a heat accumulator component. So it's kind of like a storage component where you can store it hot water and use that hot water during the power peaks. So in quite many district heating networks nowadays, we have this kind of accumulator components and we actually just updated the component physics. So we have now the stratified uh, accumulator where we have different temperature levels inside uh, inside the tank itself. So it's not just a, like two tanks, cold one and a hot one. Now it's just one big tank where we have those uh, temperature layers as they are in, in real life. And then you can just give some settings when we are charging and discharging the battery. So there are different ways, time series, uh, temperature curves, patterns, different ways to control when we are actually using the power and when we are pushing some extra power to the accumulator itself. All right, that's a very, very interesting. Yeah, I see also um, at the top in the menu that there are many other components that, uh, of course, we won't have time to go through, uh, but uh, all of them, yes, you have now the pr prosumer there. Uh, so there are many of those that are described in detail in the documentation, but we won't have, of course, time to go through now. But that's uh, just a just a reminder for for the users that they can go uh, to the documentation and read more details. Because I think often uh, when they open the demo model, they also try to find a component that it's existing in their own network, so they can learn how to model that and it can be that that component is not available in the demo model it's not included there uh, but you can then check the documentation and see how how you could include add that component into into the network um, one th thing also that i forgot to ask is um about the, this demo model specifically does it have some other controls you mentioned about the controls of the main plant that keep uh, the difference in the pressure the supply and return line but are there other controls for example for the pumps yeah so maybe i i take a one step backwards when we were talking about the the components so uh just quick mention that for example when we went through the plant components they actually have these like heat exchanger component and bump battery components inside the plant component itself so those are just internal components of plant and when we for example add this reservoir component uh heat exchanger and bump battery we will have a main plant component so okay. that's why we went through those big components where we have multiple different components internally. So you will find uh, more or less the same settings from these uh, basic components. For example, the bump battery component will have the same control node and pressure different settings, which we checked uh, earlier when we were talking about main plant and plants. Um, yeah, you ask about the controls. So yeah, there are like multiple different ways to uh, model district energy networks. And as we have the pumps inside the main plant, so basically when we define that we want to have like pressure difference and the control nodes and the pressure difference settings, we can give those exactly the same settings to control the pumps. So here we don't produce any power because it's a pumping station, but you can see that same way we have control nodes over here, same way we have the pressure difference setting over here and so on. So lots of similarities. And because this is pump component, like individual pump con component, you can give, of course, some, some other settings as well. So uh, here we can, for example, define that we want to pump constant flow or constant uh, generate constant head that we just raise the pressure always one bar or something like that. And uh, yeah, but uh, but the pump battery component itself is is, is like 
internal components of all the pump, uh, plants, of course, because we need to have some pumping inside the plant components. And uh, you can give these settings, which are in the user interface. But sometimes if we have some very complicated ones, we can also build uh, control stations where we can use, for example, Python or JavaScript to write your own custom uh, custom codes to adjust your pumpings. So it's not maybe for the first thing you want to do when you start learning a new software, but for the advanced users uh, who are able to write uh, Python or JavaScript, they can create your own uh, their own uh, custom uh, controls for like pumps or or plants or for any components. So the API is very comprehensive. You have access to any results, to any component, any internal component. So there isn't any limitations. Okay. Yes, that's interesting. I see that the type of control of this pump station is set to constant generated head and then the property right below says setting one. So is it, does it mean that it's giving one bar of, of head or pressure? Uh, yeah, actually in this case, uh, could you ask us, uh, we have exactly these two settings, but as well the pressure difference settings. So because we have a numerical simulator, we need to have some initial Quest when we uh, when we start the simulation, we have, need to have some initial values. And if you don't give these pressure difference uh, control settings, so I mean the control nodes and the pressure difference setting, uh, it would do exactly how you described that it will raise the pressure by one bar. But in this case, because I have also defined uh, the pressure difference settings, it used this type and setting only for the initial value where we start the simulation. So because when the simulation starts, the simulator doesn't know anything how the system works. And after that, uh, it just gives some random value. And that value is here how you can just say that, okay, let's just first, when we start the simulation, we start by bumping one extra bar there. And after that, it starts to maintain this one bar pressure difference uh, at these two control nodes. Okay, yes, that's that's interesting. And of course, then users now that they have the demo model, they can click on these components and uh, then explore the properties to understand how, how the pump is uh, op operating for this specific demo model and therefore exactly. then learn how, how you would do for your own own networks. Uh, could you, you have now pumps as the first property there. Could you open that uh, the property yeah. so we see, okay, so this, this is a pump battery that uh, it's a pressure booster station for instance that has two pumps, am I correct? Yes, exactly. Okay. So in fluid heat by default, uh, these pumps which have of course efficiency curve pump curve and so on they don't limit the simulation they are used for post analysis more, more or less so basically when we have simulated the model after that we can check that how well our pumps are performing under those conditions and for example here we can open uh, the working range of these pumps. So as you already uh, said that we have two pumps over here. And when I open this uh, working point uh, figure, we can see that, for example, now I'm showing the efficiency. Uh, we have these black dots over here, which are the simulated points. And um, we can see that the color indicates the efficiency of the pump. And for example, if I want to know that what would be the efficiency over here, I can always just click on top of the figure and on the left hand side, we see all the values. So the flow would be 10 and the head would be 29 and then the efficiency would be 39.09. So 
uh, this tool is very powerful for post analysis and you can set from the global modeling settings that we limit our pumping capacity by these curves but by default we are not using that so these dots over here could be actually for example here uh, outside of this area right here and the simulation would just work normally but of course you can see that okay if the dots would be in this uh, right top corner we cannot actually pump that much so it's it's all again like there are two different ways to do this you can limit your pump batteries or then you can just check these after the simulation and see that how well our pumps are performing okay yes that's very very useful too indeed um now we are soon soon running out of time maybe we we now covered i i believe most of the components they are there available if not all but um we we talked specifically about components that we can see on the map can you show us very briefly uh components that are not shown on the map for example if there are time series patterns and so on yeah so Actually, all the components uh, which exist in our model can be found from the model menu. And here you can just see the list. So first we have all the like the basic components, which you can also see on the map, junctions and so on. But when we go forward, we can see some other things like time, CV, time series curves and these parameters which we used for adjusting the component settings. And if we, for example, open this time series, uh, you can see that the, now the new tab is opened. And here we can see, for example, uh, ambient air temperature. Here you have on the left hand side all the values. And, and then we have the uh, graph over here where you can say, for example, zoom in and out and see that how the air temperature is changing uh, during the year. So and, uh, I, I see, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just saw something very interesting that uh, you have um, cost per, per ener energy production there. So you have coal and natural gas, so the different sources and the prices of it. Uh, in this demo model, you also uh, have a price, so you can see how much it costs to generate power, for instance. Exactly. So uh, when we are producing heat, of course, we need to have the fuel which we are uh, per burning in the boilers. So let's say oil, coal and so on. So you can add those prices in the model. And uh, of course, that's the one fuel we need. Then we need electricity for pumping and other devices as well. So then we can uh, calculate that how much uh, what are the costs for running the entire system? We can combine all the electricity costs and the fuel costs and use this, for example, the uh, fuel prices to uh, schedule our production. So we have the cheapest option first. And then when we go forward, the last boilers are always the oil boilers and so on. So, so yeah, that's very handy tool. and. And here you define the price. And when we go back to map view and, for example, open the uh, main plant again, you can see that we have the electricity price over here. So the time series is used over here. So okay. basically, the component gets the price from here. And after the, the during the simulation, it knows how much it produces power. So then we use the production cost for that. So when we know that, okay when we produce one kilowatt hour of, uh, of heat with natural gas, it has some specific price for that. And then we just multiply those numbers together and get the price. So very easy to calculate the total costs. No. And um, maybe, yeah, when we open the model menu again, and maybe we, because we don't have that much time, we could actually just go through this list quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have the time series, the curves. So curves are those, uh, for example, when we are adjusting 
a parameter value as a function of air temperature. Let's say that we are adjusting the uh, power consumption of the consumer as a function of air temperature. We know that when it's cold, we need to uh, heat our homes more. Uh, and when it's very warm, we are more or less using just domestic hot water. So we use these parameters for those. Then we have the pump definitions. So these are the pumps which I actually showed you uh, when we were talking about the uh, efficiency of the pumping. So basically you just build this kind of virtual pump, give all the efficiencies and that kind of things. And eventually this pump definition is like a, uh, the pump model which we can use for the simulation. Then the control stations, uh, which I also briefly mentioned before, that you can build your like custom controls with Python or JavaScript. Um, the next one is production plants. This is pretty new thing in fluid heat. So basically you can just define a schedule for your plant. So which starts first and so on. So, and then uh, automatically based on the power consumption, we start those plants from cheapest to most expensive one. Uh, then if we have some data integrations with this, for example, with SCADA or some other things, we have these data sources and some, some settings with those. So basically quite often uh, we have some external data which we want to read automatically from, from other systems. So we can build those integrations with the data data port and, and the data sources can be, for example, CSV files or some other or some other files from through the API. Uh, Ten. Yeah, Arthur, sorry, I just interrupt you a little here to mention for for someone that is starting. We Arthur is just listing this really quickly, but of course the documentation would be the place to go and and explore. Then what are all of these features there? And there's quite interactive. Um, um, let's say infrastructure there in our, in our documentation wiki page online that you can go through and learn more about the features itself. Uh, so if I may ask you Arthur before we, we end, just to briefly mention about the demo model itself, what are the um, scenarios that the user will find when they open the demo model? Because I see that there are many scenarios there that they could explore. If you yeah. could just mention what, what they do in a general level, then of course the user will later on be able to click on it and explore it. Yeah, of course. So basically the first the base scenario is this just where we have all the components. And normally when I start the modeling work, I start with the like just a, like a basic model where we have all the components. After that, I start to build those different kind of scenarios. Those scenarios can be different weather conditions, or if we have some new neighborhoods which want to, uh, we want to investigate how they would affect on the existing network, we can build a new network and connect that to the existing one. But in this case, for example, the network itself is the same one in these scenarios right here. So the only difference is just the uh, air temperature. So here the air temperature is minus 26. And when I click the scenario, you can see on the properties window that the ambient temperature is minus 26. So this is just the name of the scenario. You always need to define the actual setting. So basically I could just write anything over here, but it doesn't affect on the simulation. This is the actual parameter which defines what is the uh, air temperature during the simulation. Okay. Then we have different weather uh, conditions. We have also like weather as time series. This is like a one month simulation. Then we have a longer period of time, like one year simulation over here as well. And then I have this called low supply temperature network. So here I have changed some other parameters. So same way I had the different weather conditions, but I have also changed the supply temperature. So here I have just uh, decreased the supply temperature of the plants, and then we can investigate out what are the differences between the normal network and uh, with the with the low supply temperature network. Yes, that's very very interesting, and I see that some of the scenarios they they have 
um, children that show with different different ambient temperature how how the network would behave and more importantly i think for the demo model and for users that open it first time you can see a description of the scenario some of them uh, have the description there yes so you can open exactly. that up and then that explains in detail what this scenario is doing um, all right and then there's the last one there uh, fifth generation uh, can you tell us a bit about that yeah so I could actually just open one scanner we, so we can see what is the like the main difference with this fifth generation. Uh, we are actually still updating this a little bit more, but you can already find this kind of substation from the existing demo model, which is on the wiki page. So basically the fifth, fifth generation of district heating contains a lot of heat pumps and different substation uh, substations and uh, low temperature networks. So here we have just added a low temperature network, which is connected uh, through the heat exchanger. But as you can see, it's not hydraulically connected to the main network. So here we have the gap between those heat exchangers. So only the heat power is transferred from the main network to this uh, neighborhood, which is located over here. And um, we didn't talk so much about these drawing states in this uh, in this meeting, but from here we can, for example, see what is the supply temperature, and we can very easily see that the the temperature levels are very different in this area uh, compared to the main network over here. Just maybe a couple of words about the drawing state. So here you have some predefined drawing state where you can investigate the results. So basically, if I click pressure differences, you can see the junctions where the pressure difference is lower than one bar. And for example, supply pressures, here we have all the supply pressures and so on. These are just fully adjustable. You can uh, use the default ones, which you can download from tools. Uh, you can uh, adjust and modify these existing ones or just create completely new. So by creating a new drawing state. And yeah, for that, uh, we have probably more material because there are quite a lot of things you can do with the results and and custom sizes and so on. So so you should uh, definitely check from the wiki page how you can do those drawing states. And we have some other videos on YouTube and in some probably some other materials as well about the drawing states. All right. Yeah, that's that's true. And uh, yes, the, the very, very handy tool. And you can, of course, when you have the demo model, you can double click and explore yourself. Um, what this uh, drawing state is trying to show and what are the layers of visualizations that are put together uh, and combined in order to show this this visualization so if if you have previous be uh, knowledge or if you have been using gis based software this will be very easy to understand because it's organized in very similar way um, but before we end uh, Arthur, could you just show us one schematics which is our reporting tool so the users that get their hands on this model they will see also some schematics that you have prepared can you show us perhaps just one yeah so they can so let me just choose one for example the comparison one so let me just zoom in a little so it's easier to see this table so i talk about different scenarios and here I have a comparison of two of those. So I have the normal one and the low temperature one. And here these numbers, they are not just the numbers on the table. These are actually dynamic. So I'm fetching the data from the simulation or from the scenario results. And then I just show it on the table. So I, could, I can show you one example, for example, from the normal network where I, the production is 45.8. If I open uh, the, the settings for this single value, we can see that we have the plant, main plant, accumulator, prosumers, all those kind of things. And we use that to calculate the number over here. And it's linked to one specific scenario. 
same thing for the low temperature one and these schematics are very flexible this like just a table is very basic one you can add for example like map view pictures from here uh do we have any like good selection over here probably not but yeah you can just zoom in those if you have some <laughs> better better selection from the map view and uh, yeah if we just for example check the other one so so for example we have the plant controls so here we have a little dis description how the system works for example if we want to report some uh, uh, controls for client or something so we can see the control points and I have added the graphs that how those uh, change during the time and and yeah there are a lot of right. different ways to use schematics and this is mainly used for reporting and comparing and when you are doing the research with your model okay Thanks. Thanks a lot, Arthur. We didn't talk that much about seeing results and so on, but this schematics uh, is one way that you can also use to see results. But of course, in our documentation, uh, you will find uh, very detailed information about how to see results, time series, constant results, create your own customer re uh, custom results and so on. But thanks. Thanks a lot, Arthur. I think we, we reached our, our limit here. Uh, I think the new users um, that get their hands first in this demo model, they they will be really well off after after this explanation. Now, even myself that I I know nothing about district heating network works, I I now uh, can say that I'm more familiar with the model. So, very very okay. good job. <laughs> if good, if good I understand hear. a little, then I'm sure uh, other users more experienced with with this type of network will. will will know very well how to proceed from here even by themselves. So thanks. Uh, have a nice day and uh, see, catch you later then. Yeah, you Bye. too. Bye.